In the following session, Rainer Simon will talk about semantic annotation without the pointy brackets and introduction to Recogito. Uh, let me introduce uh, Rainer Simon first. He's a senior scientist at the Digital Insight Lab at the Austrian Institute of Technology. He has been working in the field of multimedia information management and retrieval for more than 15 years with a particular focus on technologies and user interfaces that process and visualize geospatial information. Presently, Rainer serves as a technical director of Pelagios and is also the technical lead of the open source project Recogito, an online annotation environment for texts and images. And he will uh, tell us more about that. So thank you, Rainer, that you are here. And I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to present. Yeah. Um, um, so I will be talking about a specific tool, Recogito, as you have heard. Um, I used to have slides uh, formally to talk a little bit about the background. During the past uh, presentations that I gave, I felt that slides aren't really necessary to talk about the background and the creation myth of the tool. It's really just not that relevant. So today I want to make everything as a live demo and uh, you can feel free to try it out yourself uh, while I'm talking. Uh, the tool itself is online. I will show you uh, the URL and everything and what you need to do. But basically, the next 45 minutes, I want to guide you through the essentials and, and the functionality that the tool has to offer. Uh, and then you can decide for yourself whether that's something that's useful to you. Uh, I will all also present uh, some potential exercise material for the afternoon sessions, which you may or may not want to do. So it's really up to you. It's just an option for me, some materials that you can look into if you want to play with the tool some more. So it's not exercises as such, it's really just some material for you uh, so that you have an ability to play with the tool and find out whether it's useful. Yeah, so Recogito, uh, it is an annotation tool for texts and images. As I said, it is online, so there's no need to install anything. Um, it is also open source software, which means that you could potentially download it and install it to your own machine, or you could download it uh, and install it for your department for, or institute. Uh, it is a client server application, so we'll, you will need some uh, kind of IT skills to set this up. Therefore, if you don't really want to deal with the hassle of setting up a server application, that's what the public instance is there for. Uh, you can find this under this URL, recogito.pelagios.org. So feel free to go there now uh, and register for an account if you want. Uh, so this is what you see. It's the starting page. Uh, also down here, we have a few statistics of people using it. So you can see that this, it is actually being used by people. Um, I always say that we're not exactly Twitter in terms of the user base or Facebook, but we have a small, nice family kind of community that's actively using the tool. So if you want to sign up, uh, simply pick a username, add an email address, create a password, and there you go. The email address I have to add uh, is simply being used in case you forget your password. So we will not email you. You will not get any spam from, from us. It's really just there uh, in case you forget your password and you want to send uh, an, an, email, uh, an, an email reminder for reset. Otherwise, I'm going to log in with my user. So that's here, log in. And after you log in, uh, this is what you see. Uh, we call this the workspace. So this is essentially a, an environment like a, like a file explorer where you can upload uh, documents, you can uplo upload texts in different formats, uh, either a plain text files are supported at the moment or TEI files. Uh, and you can also upload images in various formats like JPEGs, PNG and so on. Uh, you can also import from different sources. So if we click here new. We can see some alternative sources. So uh, you can, for example, import uh, images from a IIIF server. I don't know if this has been mentioned in this tool so far. That's a protocol uh, for the sort of streaming of large images that's being increasingly supported by institutions. Also, uh, I think at the University of Graz, the GAMS uh, system also supports IIIF. And there's a couple of other uh, sources you can uh, import from. but. Uh, in any case, you can upload files, uh, you can create folders. So it's pretty much your standard kind of uh, organization environment for files and, and folders. Right. Um, so I have prepared some uh, documents uh, to show you through the basic feature set. Uh, I will do this in two steps. On the one hand, I will show you first the text annotation functionality, and then I will go a little bit into the image annotation functionality. 
So for the text annotation functionality, I have uploaded already some, some texts uh, here. I will start yeah, with a sample text. In this case, it's to see it is the Peloponnesian War. Why a book like that? Uh, that's for two reasons. So on the one hand, um, the origins of the tool are from the classic. So we have developed this tool in projects with people dealing with uh, ancient literature from ancient Greece. So this is sort of a nod to the origins of Recogito. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the Peloponnesian War is a nice book because it's full of places. And you will see later on that, that Recogito is specifically built for tagging places. It's not necessarily the only thing you can do with it, uh, but sort of this kind of geo annotation is really the kind of strong point of the tool. But other than that, once you upload a text uh, and once you open it in the reading view, this is what you see, your text, and you can make selections just like you would expect with your mouse. As soon as you do that, this window pops up and you can add comments. You can also add tags. I will show later what people are doing with this so that it becomes a bit more clear, but essentially just you type any kind of tag, hit enter, or you can also add multiple tags in one go by separated by comma. Maybe I'll make it a little bit bigger so you can see it better. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's the one thing. Um, but as I said, uh, the real kind of use case for Recogito is geo annotation. So what is that? Um, essentially, when we built it, what we wanted was a tool that would allow us to build maps from text easily. And in order to do that, you would want to identify the places in the text, mark them up, connect them to coordinates so that you can quickly create a map for your text. I will show you how to do that. Uh, in this case, uh, as I said, we have a very spatial text, so that it's full of place names. Let's pick this one, for example, Tarentum. And in order to mark something as a place in Recogito, you simply hit uh, this button here, which is place. And as soon as you do that, you will get a suggestion from one of the built-in gazetteers. Uh, very often, you will see this here, uh, something that's uh, a match, which obviously is not what we want. So in many cases, we need to correct uh, manually. So in this case, we're talking about the place Taranto in Italy. Uh, so it's not in the US, we want to change that. You click change, and then you get sort of more advanced search options. Uh, the search will already be open and you will get also other matches. So in this case, um, here's what I want. This is uh, alternative matches from different gazetteers. In this case, uh, it's not geo names. I'm, I'm sure you will be familiar with geo names. So that's just an online dictionary of places. But there are other gazetteers on the web as well. In this case, we pick one from Pleiades. Uh, I don't know whether you've heard about Pleiades, but Pleiades is a specific community gazetteer from, uh, from the classic. So it's basically like a geo names, but for ancient Greece and the Roman Empire. So in this case, this is really what we want to use. We just uh, click it. And then this is what happens. Uh, it's two things. On the one hand, you have now created a connection between your text and the place name and the link in the gazetteer. So this is uh, basically working with linked data underneath the hood. Uh, and you already um, have learned about Sparkle today. So you are sort of creating these kind of semantic connections between the text and the gazetteer reference. So that's the one thing that's important. The other thing that's important is down here that says Rainer and less than a minute ago. So whatever we do, uh, we always require this kind of manual confirmation. So we never do things automatically in the tool without giving the warning that this is just an automatic match because different people may make different judgments. So it's important that this here is not the place Pleiades 442 and so on. But I, as the user of the system have said, I have made the judgment that this is sort of the place. So this kind of audit track is very important that whatever happens in the tool is always linked to the person. Um, okay, let's uh, try this a second time. In this case, I think we stand a better chance of getting the first match initially because this is probably not existing as an American city again. So um, yeah, uh, we get the right match, but again, I can already save it, but it stays sort of gray. So I know this is a, a place name that has not been verified yet. So until somebody says, this is actually the right match, it's not going to turn green. And this way we can also have this kind of workflow built in uh, of, of uh, of sort of sanity checking or that whether you know whether something has been verified and the a person has looked at it or whether it's still fully automatic. 
Right, so that's sort of the basics of, of place tagging. Uh, for those who have uh, used uh, sort of more advanced digital tools already, you will probably know that there's uh, something called uh, named entity recognition. Named entity recognition is a, an automatic process where an algorithm goes through a text um, and, uh, and identifies the, the place names automatically. So again, this is basically like automating the steps that we've made now. Uh, Recogito has this built in. Uh, and you can use um, named entity recognition. Typically, you would do this before you start manual annotation. You will probably set uh, the computer up so that the computer will do pre-tagging before, and then you can just make the correction. So this can speed up your workflow. I will show you quickly how this works. Uh, I will not perform it because if you have a long text, this can take a long time. So this might take up to 10 minutes. So I will only show you the results. Um, but in principle, it works from the workspace. So you select uh, one of your documents in the workspace. And when you select something, uh, this options box pops up uh, and gives you some things that you can do with your text. Then there's named entity recognition. You pick it. And then you can select from different named entity recognition engines. On the one hand, that usually depends on the, of, um, of the language of the text. So in this case, I would pick uh, the English language model because it's, uh, it's an English translation, obviously. But you can also select the gazetteers. So here we can avoid exactly what we saw before, uh, that geonames gets used uh, on a text that will speak only about ancient Greece and Rome. So in this case, we can say, wait, I just want nothing else uh, and only use Pleiades. So that way you can ensure that you don't get too many false matches. You will still get a lot of false matches and you will have to do your cleanup, but at least you have some kind of pre-filtering. So as I said, I won't do this now, but I will only show you the results prepared earlier. Again, this is what it looks like, uh, all gray. Um, you can pick by, you can pick, pick different colors. On the one that you can pick uh, the color by entity type. Everything that's green is a place uh, and everything that's blue is a person. So again, also you will see that the named entity recognition often gets it wrong. Uh, so this is something that you will need to clean up by hand. And say, okay, this is actually a place. Um, so this way you can go through this um, and you can also do it by verification status. Right, um, so that's sort of the basics. I want to show you a bit more uh, advanced example, uh, what you can uh, do in, in sort of productive, in a productive way. Uh, the example I want to show you is a tourist guide from Pompeii. It's from the 19th century, but it is an actual tourist guide. So from a historical perspective, it's quite an interesting uh, document because you can compare the itineraries with uh, today's itineraries and today's guidebooks. Uh, in the light of people having different interests now than they had back then. Also in the light that some things weren't excavated back then. So it's a nice document to work on. And of course, uh, it's full of place names. But in this case, we also deal a lot with place names that are very local. So in this case, we are sort of working on urban scale, not uh, on a settlement scale where you pick uh, cities and, and, and country names, but rather you will have very sort of small scale names. For example, if we pick this here, the Torre dell'Annunziata, uh, we know it's a place name, uh, but it's sometimes difficult to actually find the right gazetteer match. So I can already tell you that for Pompeii, we have lots of kind of very small scale place names as well. So it's, it works to, to use it in, in a place like that, but you sometimes need a little bit of detective work. So that's something I want to show you now, how you can use this kind of detective work in Recogito to build your maps uh, better. In this case, I pick it as a place, as I said, um, it doesn't find an automatic match. So here are some tricks that you can try to find better matches. Uh, first of all, you will always see up here, that's the thing that you have uh, marked in the text, but you can always modify that. So in this case, maybe we remove a little bit of this and hope that we find more matches. And indeed, uh, by sort of sometimes simplifying uh, your queries, you can find better matches. So let's take a look at this. Uh, that's exactly what I'm looking for from the digital atlas of the Roman Empire. I can pick it. And this way I could use a little bit of my own expert knowledge to mark this up as a place, even though the computer wouldn't be able to do that by, by itself. Let's make another thing. Naples, again, as a place. So it gives me an ancient reference. Maybe I think uh, that this might still not be appropriate because it's it's a, it's a guidebook from the 19th century. Maybe my decision would be that this still would be 
so geonames might be more appropriate here because we're really not talking about the ancient place. So again, it's this kind of little judgments that you always have to make, whether this is an ancient place, whether it's a new place, which gazetteer might be most suitable and so on. Yeah, so that's a good example. So this is also something that happens when you mark up a place. Uh, this place might be in the text uh, further down uh, again. Uh, and Rikokito will also will automatically suggest uh, whether you want to reapply this annotation. So in this case, we have two more occurrences of the phrase Nepus. And it asks me, do you want to also apply the same annotation? In this case, I say, yes, let's just do that. And then I hope I will find this somewhere further down in the text. Uh, it could be <laughs> quite further down. But yeah, um, so this way you can kind of automate uh, the process a little bit because multiple copies of the same place name will be tagged with the same thing. Can be dangerous sometimes because you don't always know whether it's really the same place in the different contexts, but sometimes it helps you to be just quicker with this. And another example I want to show you with this kind of detective work, uh, which shows that uh, you have to really bring your own knowledge of a place sometimes to tag a document efficiently. Uh, let's take this one, the forum Nundinarium, otherwise called the soldier's quarters. Again, I think this is a nice example because a computer wouldn't be able to map that anyway, but you as a reader know this is definitely a place name. So it's, it's like selected as a place. Again, nothing found, of course, but if we look at the text, it says, the letter name was given to the quadrangle. And uh, if you know something about uh, uh, Pompeii, which I don't, but uh, Valeria, my colleague who has set up this example, she knows this, so I, I, I'm copying her example here. Uh, so with your knowledge of, of, of Pompeii, you might be able to still find this. So on the one hand, it's the quadrangle. Let's just search for the quadrangle, why not? Oh. Again, nothing I can find. But another trick, you can do this, for example. Now let's say, let's search for everything that starts with quad. Well, okay, so I get many hits. In this case, it's too many. Uh, I don't really know which one would be the right one. So I can do one more thing. I say everything that starts with quad and so you can use this kind of logical operators, compare. In this case, uh, we actually find just a single hit and for those who know about uh, Pompeii, this is actually the right place. So again, you can use this kind of search tricks and advanced search features to narrow down your search and find the right places in the gazetteers in a way that the computer automatically wouldn't be able to. So in this case, we pick this. Now we have it, let's say, okay. And uh, so you have tagged some places. Whenever you have tagged places, you can switch to the map. Let's do this. So the map will give you uh, all the places that you've tagged. In this case, let's take a look at this. So that's the quad reporters that I just tagged. Uh, you will also have the option to jump between the text and the map. Uh, and uh, the size of the dots also indicates how many times something has been tagged. So Naples is something that we tagged three times. So I tagged it manually two times. I tagged it manually one time and it was automatically reapplied twice. So in this case, the Naples dot is just bigger. And we can see here are three annotations and you can also flip between uh, the different texts that have been tagged with Naples. Right, uh, so that's basically all there is to tell about the, the text view. Uh, in order to get you, give you a better idea of what other people who've been using it longer are doing with this, I want to show you some examples that other people have already prepared. Um, yeah, so one thing which I like uh, is uh, a public document uh, by another user. Uh, and this also is a nice example to show you the search functionality. So you have this kind of box up here, which says search my workspace. And if you down, uh, hit the down arrow, you can do a little bit more. So in this case, I can search all of Recogito, which means all the documents that people have made public. I will come to this in a minute. Uh, every document that you upload is only visible to you, but you can make them public if you want to. So what we can do now is we search in the public documents and uh, I search for something. Here we go. Let's see what happens. Uh, that's bad. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I was searching for. So that's a document by a different user. Uh, it's called the Bordeaux itinerary. Uh, it's a fourth century a document, which is a tra travel report from Bordeaux in France to Jerusalem and back. 
So this user has tagged everything. Um, and that really shows nicely uh, how in, in some cases, uh, the maps that you get from a written document are really great and instructive. So you can see this was the path uh, to Jerusalem, the north from here, and then that's the way back. You can also see that every, every sort of city was tagged, but also the regions. So people talk about Italy, for example, or they talk about a certain district uh, again. So you can see that the gazetteers, it depends on the gazetteers that are in the system, but many of the gazetteers also include polygons for regions and stuff. So it really is a nice way to see a text from a different perspective very easily. Uh, a second example I want to show you, um, I think I have this in there. Uh, yes. That's part of uh, the Iliad. Uh, it's, a it's, it's a part of, of the Iliad, which is called the catalog of ships. So Homer speaks about uh, the various uh, factions and people that have participated in the war. Um, and uh, Elton, my colleague who has tagged this document has used tags to say, to say something about sort of the nationality as it were of the people. So it's, that's the Boyotian contingent. And if you scroll down, that's kind of a different region, Euboean and Abantus contingent. So you have tagged kind of the different participants to the story. Uh, and first of all, I want to show this. Uh, when you color by the tag, it's a nice way to kind of see the different focus points. So in this case, he's used tags uh, to distinguish between the different people. Um, and if you look at the map, you can also use the tags for coloring. So you have color by and you can color by tag. And then you can see kind of these different factions of the story. Again, it's an easy way to get a bit more out of your text or get a different perspective of your texts by very simply tagging things uh, with tags and spatial relations. Final text example that I want to show is, let's see, no, that's the wrong folder. This one. Yeah, first of all, um, you can upload multiple texts in one go. Uh, so you can select like four texts from your computer and you can drag them into the workspace and then they will get uh, uploaded as a single document. So this is normally useful if you have a book, say with uh, like 10 chapters and every chapter is a separate text file. And then you have uh, the reading view and here on the side you have essentially the table of contents. Uh, my colleague Valeria has made uh, creative use of this feature, not by uploading a book with different sections, but she collected texts from different authors and all these texts speak about Arabia. So it's all uh, authors from antiquity, like Strabo, Procopius, Herodot Herodotus, and so on. And she tagged all of these different uh, texts. And because they're in one document, they all end up in one map and again, you can use the map coloring options. In this case, let's color this by, uh, by part. Part means by different texts. And one thing which you can nicely see is that, um, for example, if you look at the text from Procopius, that seems to talk a lot about quite different regions than Strabo, for example. Uh, then those white dots here, uh, they indicate um, places that have been mentioned in multiple documents. So that's kind of the overlap. So that's also a nice way to compare different texts against itself, against each other. Right, uh, just some, uh, uh, I guess, um, examples to, to get you started if you want to play with this yourself. Uh, but for time reasons, I will switch to a different thing now, uh, namely the functionality for annotating images. As I said, you can also upload images in different formats. I've done this here. Uh, since Recogito is a tool for geo annotation, it's really most useful for maps, I would say. So that's why I'm also using uh, a map as, as the demo example here. The features look pretty similar. You have, again, kind of this reading view. Um, you can also do a full screen representation. You can zoom, you can pan. So it's the kind of usual interface that you expect nowadays. You can also rotate which is sometimes really useful for maps because they have those uh, place names written in different uh, orientations. Like here, for example. Um, and up here in the toolbar, you have different drawing tools. Uh, you can mark a point, you can mark a rectangle, or oh, this is my favorite tool, it's called the tilted box. Uh, that allows you to draw 
uh, a box at an arbitrary rotation with just two mouse clicks. So let's try this out here. So I click once, I move the mouse uh, and I move it up. And this way I have uh, created a box around this toponym here. And uh, Recogito also knows which side is down because that's sort of the baseline. So it has a, it's quick to use and it gives you up and down orientation too. The, the editor pop-up uh, looks just the same. Um, it just has an edit line called transcribe, which makes sense if you're working with maps. Again, uh, sometimes when working with this material, you probably need some detective work. Uh, in this case, I think you can't really find anything about this in, in your gazetteer. I looked this up uh, and I found out that it's near a place called Stukis Holmo in Iceland. So just for the demo, I was sort of fake this now with my own knowledge just so that you can see that it's also placed on the map. Let's take this here. But other than that, the process works identical. So again, you have your GeoNames link, which means you have a geo coordinate. Um, it's confirmed that it was done by me. And uh, let's move to the map. And again, it looks similar as before with the text. You get a marker. And just like with the text, you will get um, a preview of the annotation. In this case, it's an image. And it's also rotated correctly because of this kind of tool that allows us to give the, uh, the bottom orientation. Sometimes uh, for people who take images, um, it's, it's also quite convenient to have, uh, to be able to export those images. So just as a small hint here, sort of a pro professional tip, you always have, you have this kind of sharing icon down at the bottom. And if you click that, you will get a link that points directly to the annotation. So you can share a link with somebody else and they will open not just the document, but directly this annotation. Or you even have a link uh, to the image directly. So I will open this separately so that you can see it. So this is just a link to a JPEG image. So in case you want to sort of cut out all your annotations and then do some processing on them, uh, every annotation gets its own URI and even the images get their own URI and you can export them. Right. Um, that's, yeah, that's mostly what, uh, what the annotation interface is about. Again, I want to show you some ex examples of, of what other people have done with this. Um, let me check my cheat sheet. Yeah. So my first example is this. Again, it's a map uh, because as I said, this is where it's most useful. I think that's an interesting example because it doesn't look like a map at the first glance, at least not from sort of our Western modern perspective. Uh, it's an early Islamic map um, from a manuscript called the Book of Curiosities. So first of all, when you encounter this as somebody who's not familiar with the matter, it will not tell you much. So again, uh, having a map view and having a geotech actually helps because here you can see, okay, so this is uh, places around the coast. Let's just try something here. Uh, so this is the river Lixus. If we jump to the image, you can see, uh, okay, so this is really sort of the North African part. And if we go here, for example, where will we end up? So that's more Turkish coast, Levante. So it helps you sort of navigate between the image in the manuscript and um, the modern geography that we're just used to seeing. Um, the big ones, by the way, are islands. So that's also interesting. Yeah. So again, it can, can be a help, especially for introducing people to new kind of materials. I think. Another example. Uh, is from a project that we worked on previously. Again, is something that you can find in the public documents. It's an atlas from the 15th century. It should be this one here. Yeah, it's an atlas, um, a so-called Portolan atlas, which means that it's rich in place names uh, and those place names, they hug the coastline. So it's very dense. Uh, if you look uh, at this in the map view, it becomes even more obvious. So you can see, okay, this is really from the UK, entire Mediterranean, Black Sea, and so on. Um, if we color this by parts, so the parts are the different atlas pages. So it's also nice you can see exactly which atlas pages deal with which region. And again, you can see that there's overlap. So some places appear in multiple atlas pages. And if we look at this, for example, you can directly compare 
the different spelling variants, the different kind of uh, images and, and the manuscript tense. Again, it's a really nice way to, to compare the different, uh, compare the different kind of materials that you have working with you. And finally, uh, one example I want to show you uh, to illustrate that people are using this for quite different things. Oh, I think I have to use do this differently. Yeah, so first of all, um, you can visit other users' workspaces. So I've done this here. Uh, so there's a user, Flor Herrero. Uh, so everybody like your Twitter handle in a way you get your Recogito handle. And what people will find there is all the documents that you have made public. If you haven't published anything, they won't find anything. But if you have made something public, uh, then you can find, you, people can find this on your, on your profile if, if you want this. So this is something that's public and it's a manuscript. And again, uh, it has used Recogito to, to transcribe. I personally would say Recogito is not a great tool for transcribing, but uh, some people do it. Uh, and what you can see here is also interesting because they use tags, for example, to insert canonical identifiers, for example. Or they also have used the geo spatial tagging functionality because here's a place name that's mentioned. Or it's this one that's, I think that's a name, for example, here marked as a person. And that's interesting because um, we don't really have this kind of uh, great uh, tagging functionality that we have for places. We don't have that for people. So it would be great if you had like automatically a suggestion for a wiki data link to a person, but we don't have this, unfortunately. So people have find their own workarounds. In this case, uh, this user, she has marked this as a person, um, has provided sort of a name, common known, commonly known name now plus uh, a Wiki Wikipedia URI. So that's sort of your own kind of makeshift uh, semantic tagging. So I really like this as an example. Uh, so that's, I think, all that I wanted to tell about uh, the text interface and the image. Finally, I want to show some sort of common things that will be important. Uh, can you still hear me? I, I see that my internet connection is stable. Okay. So I hope that you can still hear me. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so when you upload a document, I was already speaking about this um, earlier. Uh, no, no, sorry, just a second. No, doesn't matter. So when you upload your own document, you will get this icon here, which says document settings. Uh, this is only available to the owner of the document or to somebody who have given admin rights in the document. I'll quickly look, uh, guide you through this. Um, so first of all, uh, you have some kind of minimal metadata that's really just so that you have some, it's not a metadata management system, but at least it allows you give a, a title for a book and some minimal descriptive information so that you can see it in your own workspace and that other people know what it is. Um, what's maybe important is this here, uh, you can pick a license. So per default, there is no license set at all, uh, but you can say this is an in copyright or out of copyright text. You can have the CC licenses. And this is important for sharing because unless you have set a public license, you can't make the document public in the system. So that's one thing. Once you have, there is this sharing button here on the side. And as you will see, uh, first of all, it says public access. That means whether anyone can find it uh, without, you, without you knowing about it. So that per default is always off. So everything that you upload is only visible to you and no one else. But uh, if you have set an open license, you can make it available to either anyone on the web or anyone on the link, uh, anyone with the link. Uh, anyone with the link simply means uh, that you can share this link with anyone. You can send an email and they will be able to open it with the link. Uh, of course, that means it's open to anyone, but there's still a difference to anyone on the web. And that is that when you pick anyone on the web, it will also get picked up by search engine. So potentially, uh, if you select anyone on the web, people can also Google your document, for example. Anyone with the link is a little bit more secret in a way. Technically, it's open, but search engines won't find it. Once you have made it public, you can also uh, configure the, the degree um, of sharing. Uh, per default, uh, it's only read only, so you share it, but people can only look at it. 
uh, or you can only make the data available. That's sometimes interesting if you have a copyrighted image and you still want to make the map and the annotations publicly available. And this is the option that you need. In this case, the image itself gets closed, but the, but the map is visible. And finally, you can make it totally open so that anyone even can add their own annotations. That's what we call this the crowdsourcing mode. Uh, you do have to have an account on Recogito, um, but anyone who has an account on Recogito can make it. Finally, if you don't want to make it public, but you still want to share with specific users in the system, there's this collaborators field here, and there you can enter specific people, like my colleague Valeria, for example, you can grant her access, and you can again say whether that's read access or write access, which means that Valeria also can annotate now, or admin access means that Valeria can have access to this menu, can edit the metadata, can also invite other users and so on. Another thing which is interest, uh, which is probably useful here is this part here, the annotation preferences. If you click here, the first thing uh, is you can select the gazetteers, just like you could select the gazetteers for named entity recognition. You can actually restrict the gazetteers for a document. Again, uh, I could have used this before uh, to sort of switch off geo names. In this case, if I had switched off geo names, you wouldn't have gotten this false match in the States. So again, if you know that you're working in a specific area or region or in a specific time, then it makes sense uh, to use the right gazetteers and you can figure that. You can configure that in here. And down here, that's also interesting. So that's the vocabulary for the tags. Uh, you can upload a list of tags. In this case, uh, you can still sort of freely type your tags, but you will get at least a suggestion list. So this is important for people who want to work with a controlled vocabulary. And also, as you can see here, um, the controlled vocabulary doesn't just have to be a list of, of labels. You can also have a URI for each tag. So in this case, you can actually tag uh, in a semantic way. Yeah, so that I think are the most important parts about uh, the document settings. And finally, and that's also really important, so I really want to con conclude with this one, is the download options. So when you upload something in Recogito, the idea is not that it stays there and it's a silo, but really you should use Recogito for the tagging. And once you're done with the tagging, you want a good way to get the data out uh, and go further and do further analyses, or do whatever you want in different tools. So it's really important for us to offer as many download options as possible. Um, the download options that are available depend a little bit on the type of document that you're working with and also on the types of annotations that you've made. Normally, you will always, well, you will always have uh, a CSV download. It's basically just a spreadsheet with uh, one annotation per row. You get some information about the text that was tagged or the image region that was tagged, the comments that are written in there, the text that we used, and so on. Then there's always the RDF download, of course, because underneath the hood, you're always generating linked data. Uh, and the JSON LD download is the real export. Files. It gives you a JSON LD document where every annotation is expressed as RDF according to the uh, W3C web annotation format. So I'm not sure whether you've heard about that, but that's sort of a formal specification for how annotations look like on the web uh, as RDF or when expressed as JSON LD. And it's governed by the W3C, the World Wide Web uh, Consortium. So that's uh, also available as a download in your code. And then, depending on what you've done, uh, you always you also get a GeoJSON download. That's a type of document which only includes the map data. Um, and you can use it, for example, to import it into a geographic information system or to build a web map. Uh, KML is a similar format that's just supported by different tools. Um, and then sometimes you get uh, export formats that have the entire documents. So for images, that's not available, but for text, you can download a TEI representation uh, that's available for, if, if you have uploaded the text as a TEI, you will basically get the same text back just with the annotations that you made in addition. And if you uploaded the plain text, you will get a very simple sort of template TEI back, which you can maybe then use to create a better TEI or to to make it conform to specific requirements. Right, um, yeah, uh, you also have other options. Uh, for example, uh, that's something which I actually forgot. I just quickly want to jump into that. Uh, there is a nice uh, additional annotation called relations. 
and I still want to show you this, relations is an annotation mode where you can select an annotation and create connections to other annotations. So that might be interesting for people who want to build networks. And the reason why I, this occurred to me now, if you do this, you will also get network export options. So you can create an annotation which says nearby. And you create this kind of networks, just like in the same way that you can use Recogito to build maps from texts, you can also use it to build networks from texts. It's still a bit beta uh, in terms of the feature, but again, um, you have now created a link. And if you go to the export option, you get extra options which say uh, either as a spreadsheet where every relation is, is a row, or you can also export this to Gephi, which if you heard about it, that's a, that's a popular tool for, for graph analysis. Right. I'm almost at the end of my 45 minutes. So very, very briefly, I want to present some texts that I prepared for you uh, in case you want to try uh, this out uh, afterwards in the afternoon yourself. Uh, it's in this folder called uh, Lise exercise material. So this is a public folder. I will paste the URL in the, in, the, in the chat afterwards. So if you go to this folder, you will see these documents. Uh, it's two text documents and two image documents. Um, just briefly, uh, I picked these documents because it's really two nice things. The one is a, a tour made by, I think, two Englishmen through Styria in the 19th century. It's really great. I looked through it and I decided I need to read actually the whole text. It has sort of a very Jules Verne, uh, 80 days around the world vibe to it. It starts in London. So they basically start off talking about, oh, we started in London, we went to Calais and then they go through Upper Austria and Styria and down to Corinthia. So it's really one of those documents where I would really like to see a map from. So it's really great to having this whole journey mapped. Um, the other document is also nice, I think. So that's um, a botanical guide from the early 20th century, summer flowers of the high Alps. And this one's great and specifically, so unfortunately I'm, I'm running out of time, so I can't really speak about this in the way that I wanted to, but it's full on the one of places. That's just, so I'm just picking this at random here. It's mostly based in Switzerland. So let's say you have, sorry, so you can tag the places. Again, I'm using my tricks to maybe find a match. So that, that will do. So at least it keeps it up on the map. But it's also full of species, right? So you have the yellow horned sea poppy. Um, and again, it would be great to have uh, sort of this lookup functionality built in where you can really just already add a Wikidata URI. That unfortunately is not possible. But if you, if you Google, for example, for the yellow horned sea poppy, let's just do this. Let's see whether we find. Um, uh, wiki data URI for this. So in this case, okay, at least I can find a Wikipedia ID, but maybe we can find something in wiki, wiki data too. Yeah, we can. So again, unfortunately, this is tedious because you need to do it manually, but at least there's a theoretical way where you can now tag this using wiki data. Again, it's a little bit of a sort of a workaround. But the cool thing about it is you have now made, you have a place and very nearby you have a Wikidata species. So this way you can build up networks between places and other things that reside on Wikidata. And I think that's kind of an exciting uh, potential, which in the future, I hope we will have built in more uh, thoroughly or more directly. So and finally in the last minute, uh, exercise material for images. Again, there are two documents one on the flora of Greece and on the fauna of Greece. Uh, this also demonstrates uh, IIIF. So this is hosted at a library. I think it's um, probably from National Library of France. Um, it's full of plant species. Again, uh, I think uh, one of the great use cases perhaps is that you can tag on the one hand, individual areas on the plants, or you can tag the plant as a whole. And if you can find it on Wikidata, you can add the Wikidata identifier. And again, you have this kind of connection between an image in a historical source uh, and kind of an authoritative entry on Wikidata. So I think this is really kind of the, uh, the sweet spot uh, where tools in the future might help you to build up this kind of knowledge graphs. Yeah, um, that I think concludes my 45 minutes, perfectly on time almost. 
Um, I will be available in the afternoon session if you have questions. But otherwise, I think uh, either I'm handing over to Becca or maybe there's a short break in between. But yeah, for my talk, uh, that concludes what I wanted to show you. And I hope that you will uh, find the time to play with Recogito in the afternoon session uh, and decide whether it's something that's useful to you. Thank you very much, Rainer, for this fascinating tutorial with uh, Recogito without these uh, scary brackets. <laughs> Um, maybe we just have there are a couple of questions in the chat. We maybe can go them through. So I will just will read them out. So is it possible to import metadata as CSV Excel sheet some other format? So the metadata for the documents can't be exported, unfortunately. But as I said, that's really not the strong point. It's it's really for the annotations and minimal metadata. But yeah, maybe as a future option that would be interesting. And I think that the same is for uh, Tara's question with just adding RDF and LOD to it. So I think we... Yeah, I mean, what you enter in the metadata fields, so as I said, is not much. It's the title, it's the author, it's some date information. That also will be exported to the JSON-LD export. So you will have this as a, as a sort of header information uh, expressed as Dublin core properties somehow. I need to look up the details, but yeah. Okay, um, does Recogito support IIIF manifests uh, for import of images, for example? Yes, so the, the last example that I show was a IIIF manifest. So you can import, uh, it's, it's a bit of a, a race against time. So we do uh, support every IIIF image manifest. So if you have a single image that works uh, for presentation manifests, which import entire collections and entire books, it only works with kind of a single hierarchy. So one book with many pages, but not collections of collections. And also, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't support the presentation API version three at the moment, that's the latest. And libraries are now moving into this area, but uh, we are replacing uh, sort of the, the presentation layer. So hopefully by the end of the year, at least uh, presentation API version three will be available again. Okay, thank you, Bev. I think three more questions. So uh, Katharina is asking if uh, Recogito allows to define a fixed text set for relations. I must admit, I don't even know. I, I think not. Uh, I think the, the tag sets that you upload only affect the tag sets for the annotations, but not the relations. That might be. I need to check. Very so the answer is specialized either. questions. <laughs> yeah. No, but that's great. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, uh, Richard is asking, uh, to upload a text document, which format do I have to use? Yeah, so if it's a plain text, sort of a .txt, uh, it should be UTF-8. That's the only requirement. If you have some kind of uh, obscure encoding, it might break, uh, but you will see it. So it, it doesn't even upload if, if it's not in the right format, but UTF-8 is, is safest. And then for TEI, <laughs> In theory, any TI file will work. Uh, in practice, that's not always the case. Um, so I would say TI, try it. And if it doesn't work, do get in touch with us because sometimes it's small fixes that we need to make to make it happen. Okay, and the last question from Katrina. Um, could you expand on the reason why you would not recommend Recogito for transcribing documents? Yeah, that's simply a user interface question. So. I think it's just not an efficient user interface. You have to drag a box for every line and then you type in the line. Uh, so the really good transcription tools that I've seen will have sort of more the side-by-side -side view where you have the document and you have your lines marked up and then next to it, you have uh, a, a full text editor where you can just type down the lines and you will be more, uh, you will be faster there, I think. Uh, there is no technical difference, I would say, and you can do the same things. But I think as an environment, it's not as productive as something like from the page, for example. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your very fascinating tutorial again. <laughs>